Bible, you will turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. Hebrews, chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 4, and we'll stay in those four verses this morning. Uh, sometimes this evening, if you come back, we may be in page turning, we may do a little bit this morning. But let's turn to Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Call your attention to the very last part of verse 2, where it says, he made the worlds. He made the worlds. Who made the worlds? Well, the Son of God made the worlds. I want us to think about that this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we have opportunity to be together. And Lord, it is my earnest prayer that your Holy Spirit will direct and guide us as we look into your word today. Cause our hearts to be open and receptive to what you would say to us. And Lord, again, we pray if there is in this service or in the children's church a soul who does not know you, may they come to trust you in this hour. And for those who do know you, May our hearts be drawn closer to yours, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The question of origins is one that has been debated for centuries. Scientists and those who are not scientists have written volumes of books and given countless hours of lectures and made unending videos on the subject. The answers, more often than not, are contradictory to each other. And even among those who fall into a certain camp, don't agree with each other. So then how do we find the truth? Where did everything come from? Where did everything start? What's the beginning of it all? Well, if we could go back in time and talk to someone who was there, at the very beginning, we'd find out, wouldn't we? But while that sounds good, there's a problem with that idea. Time travel doesn't work. Uh, time is a quantity. It had a beginning, and at some point, it will have an end of Revelation chapter 10, tells us time shall be no more. There's coming eventually an end to time. Time is a measurement. It's a measurement of our lives and the lives of others and events that have happened. And we date things so that we have a, a, something to relate to as to when certain things occur. But you can't travel through time. Once time is spent, you can never reclaim it or use it again. Now think about this. When somebody spends their time with you, somebody gives you a few minutes of their time, they are giving you a gift that they will never have to give to anyone else. Once it's given, it's given. And that's it. If we waste time, we are wasting part of our lives because time is a measurement of your life. So if you waste your time, you're literally wasting your life. Very important to understand time. Time that is future cannot yet be used. There are no time do-overs, and there is no time credit card that we can spend now and pay for later. No such thing. So time that is future cannot be used. Time that is past cannot be reused. And so every moment that we have is deliberate and is precious. So we can't go back in time. We can't talk with people who have already left this life. Some people claim to, but they do not. But you know what we can do? We can hear people talk who are no longer here. You do it all the time. Many years ago, we were doing a special Wednesday night service here, and uh, I talked about voices from the past. And over the sound system, we heard President John F. Kennedy speak. Now, he had not been on earth for decades by that time, at least 30 years by that time. How did he speak? You know how? A recording. A recording. And you hear people on recordings anytime you want to, uh, video recordings, sound recordings, 
uh, who are no longer here, but you can hear the words that they spoke. But suppose you're listening to a speech by somebody, you're listening to someone talk, you listen to somebody sing a song on a recording, and you'd like to ask them a question about it. Can they answer you? No. Why? They're not here. You're just hearing a replay of what they said or saying when they were here. We can't talk with the people who have already left this time. We cannot go back in time. We cannot have a conversation with those people. But we can call back those things which are recorded, whether by sound or by video or in writing. We can look back at ancient evidence through archaeology and more and more uh, archaeology is discovering new knowledge about the past and things that have happened. We can look at the results of how things are now and formulate theories as to how they came to be as they are. It's this way now, it's logical that this is how it got to be here. I'll give you an example. The other day, I was with some people in a car and we came to railroad crossing. And there was no train visible, no lights flashing or anything. And I told the people in the car, I said, a train just went by. And if you don't see it, you don't hear it, but I can tell it just went by. They said, how do you know? I said, left its tracks. <laughs> <laughs> but things can be tracked. And we can follow tracks to lead us back to where they came from or look ahead to where they went. Just as we can hear things that were spoken or sung years ago, we can read things that were written long ago. Now we have some ancient documents that we can refer to. The most ancient human writing that has been found to date is the Sumerian tablets, cuneiform tablets found from Sumeria. Sumeria is a civilization that's not around anymore. But they wrote some things, and the oldest writing in the Sumerian language is the story of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is a fellow who uh, is told of an impending flood that's coming, and he builds a boat, and he puts his family and animals on that boat to survive the flood. And they do. That story sound familiar to anybody? You, you heard something like that somewhere else? You have, haven't you? Sure. That is the oldest known writing, human writing, that's been found to date. But those cuneiform tablets, even though they found thousands and thousands of these tablets, they're, they're very little complete documents there. A lot of what has been found is, is like financial transactions, business transactions, records of uh, different things. Uh, so not really interesting historically, but not really telling us anything about origins. But what about other ancient documents? Do we have anything else? Well, as a matter of fact, we do. We have some documents that record things that happened at least 6,000 years ago. We call those documents the Bible. The Bible is older than the writings about Buddha. What do you mean the writings about Buddha? He didn't write, he didn't write much. He really didn't. You'd think Buddha wrote his own Bible, but he didn't. Most of Buddhism is based on what other people wrote about Buddha. But he didn't write very much. It's certainly older than the writings of Muhammad. Uh, it's older than any Indian writings about Krishna or uh, any of the other multitudes of gods that Hindus have and Indians have. Much older than that. So we come to this ancient book called the Bible. Now, I have a Bible, I don't have it in front of me this morning, but I have a Bible that's well over 400 years old. Obviously, I don't carry it around much or handle it very much. That's old, but that's, that's relatively new when it comes to the Bible. Bible writings go back not hundreds of years, thousands of years. So we can look back again at least 6,000 years in history for these documents that we call the Bible. Now let's look at some of the evidence that's given here. Look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. The first thing it says, and if your Bible's like mine, it's in all capital letters, is God. Now the writer of Hebrews here doesn't introduce us to God, doesn't say let me tell you about God, who God is, just states God as an accepted fact. 
assuming that the reader knows who God is and knows about God. I'm going to tell you that there was, and this is easily proven historically, there was a point in ancient history when every human being on planet knew about God. Now, it doesn't mean they all were believers. It doesn't mean they all knew God himself. They knew about God. And that's easily demonstrated in history. So God is stated here, he's named in the sense of being, and in the sense of being an accepted fact. Just like in Genesis 1-1, where it says, in the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of everything that we know by our five senses. Everything that you can see, hear, taste, touch, smell, everything. In the beginning, God. And again, Moses in writing Genesis doesn't explain to us, oh, I, I'm sure you don't know who God is, so let me explain that to you. doesn't do that. He states God as an accepted fact. Because again, there, at that point in history, everybody knew there was a God. It doesn't mean everybody followed him. It doesn't mean everybody served him, but they knew of his existence. So in the beginning, God did what? Created the heavens and the earth. Created, that's that's a very important statement. If you look in your bullets in this morning, you'll find a quote there from the founding document of the United States of America, the Declaration of Independence, and you'll find that in there, God is acknowledged as the creator. They didn't quibble about that. They didn't wonder about that. They didn't suggest it might be a possibility. It's stated as fact. All men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Where do we get our rights? From government? No, from God. According to who? The government. Does that make sense? Do you see that? It's pretty clear, isn't it? So, it tells us here in Hebrews 1, God who at sundry times. Now, you probably don't use that term, sundry, a great deal. We used to see it in our country here. A lot more than we do now. There used to be stores that were called sundries. Uh, you don't see that. It was a sundry store. The store sold all kinds of things. Okay, Largely, they would have a pharmacy or something like that. They would dispense medicine, but they'd have all kinds of other things. So the store sundry sold different things. We still have stores like that. We just don't call them that anymore. But God, who at sundry times, at different points of time, and the wording here indicates a repeated action happening at various intervals of time. So what's it saying? God did something at different times. Not the same way every time, but did something at different times. And what did he do? Look at it. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners. What does it mean, diverse manners? Diverse just means different. In different manners. So God used different methods and different means. And what did he do repeatedly at different intervals, different points in time? What did he do using different methods, different means? He spoke. So has God spoken before? He has. God at sundry times, many different times, and in diverse manners, many different ways, spake in times past. Who did he speak to? The fathers. Who are the fathers? Our ancestors. So God spoke to our ancestors different times in many different ways. And then spoke by the prophets. Who are the prophets? The prophets are the preachers, people who God had called and used particularly to convey his message. And the meaning here refers, no doubt, to the writing prophets. Who are the writing prophets? People like Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, writing prophets. Moses was a prophet. He certainly was. Job also wrote prophetically. And so Job and the writings of Moses are the oldest books in the Bible. And I will say this to you, some of the oldest books ever written. Job may be the very first book that was ever written. But wait a minute, you said the ultimate, no, I, what I'm saying either, that's the oldest writing found. Now, the oldest complete manuscript, the oldest document that's all there that has been found so far is a copy of the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is written much later than the writing of Moses, but I'm telling you about something that's all there, no pieces missing. It's, it's all there. 
But God spoke to someone. Who did he speak to? The fathers. How did he speak to them? Through various means at different times, and particularly through the prophets. Now, the prophets that he spoke through, as we said, Moses, Job, and others, the prophets spoke of the existence of God. So God's existence is acknowledged here, and he spoke at different times, different ways, and then there were those who recorded what God said, and we call them the prophets. But something changed. What changed? Look at verse 2. Well, I'll go back to verse 1 for the flow of thought. God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Very important statement. Very important statement. So God, for thousands of years, spoke to people at different times in different ways, and it was recorded by the prophets. So we have here the stated fact of the existence of God. We have here the stated fact that God has spoken to mankind throughout the history of mankind. And then something changed where God speaks to mankind through his son. Well, wait a minute. Did people way back in the Old Testament know that God had a son? Absolutely. If you'll read Psalm 2, it talks about the only begotten son of God. If you read the last chapter of the book of Proverbs, it talks about God's son. And there are other references to the son of God in the Old Testament writing. So did people in the Old Testament know that God had a son? Absolutely they did. Uh, do you remember the story in Daniel where the three Hebrews, we call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that was their Chaldean names, their Hebrew names are different. And they wouldn't bow to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. He said, if you don't bow, you're going to burn. And they said, well, we're not bowing. So he said, well, you're burning. And they put him in the furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar looks in the furnace, and he says, I saw it. we threw three men in that furnace. Now, the kind of man Nebuchadnezzar was, he was a total dictator. He was completely in charge, and you did not cross him. So if Nebuchadnezzar said, we put three men in there, and they put two men, everybody would say, you're right, King, we put three in there. Yeah, they, they wouldn't argue with him. They would confirm anything he said. Why? Because if they didn't, they might be the next one in the fire. He was like that. But he said, I thought we put three men in the fire. And they were all saying, yes, sir, you're right, King. We put three men in the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I see four men in the fire. And that fourth one looks to me like the Son of God. Now, you've got to stop and ask yourself, did people in the Old Testament know that God had a son? Evidently, they did. What, Nebuchadnezzar just came up with this idea out of his own mind and experience? He wasn't a student of Moses. He wasn't a student of the Scriptures. Where did he get that idea? Because people in that day and time in the Old Testament period knew that God had a son. And Nebuchadnezzar looks in that fire and he sees somebody, a fourth man. He doesn't expect to see a fourth. He expects to see three. He sees a fourth man in there. And this one looks different. Different than what? Different than the other three? Well, definitely different than the other three. But in reality, different than anything or anyone he had ever seen before. And he said, that's got to be the Son of God. We could go on with that. But the point is that people in the Old Testament knew that God had a son. So God has spoken different ways at different times, and the prophets recorded God's word. And then in these last days, now that's an interesting phrase by itself, in these last days, the last or later days, the days getting near the time of the end of the world as we know it. He spoke to our ancestors, but now he is speaking to us. To you and I. And he's speaking through his son. Now let's learn more about this son. Verse 2. He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Whom he, God, hath appointed heir of all things. What does that mean? It means the son of God is the legitimate owner by the will of God of all things. And what does all things mean? It means all things. It means he owns everything. Well, not only does he own everything, but why does he own everything? Look again, verse 2. God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he, God, made the worlds. God made the worlds. How? By his Son. 
Very clear statement there. It's exactly what it's telling us. It's going to tell us a little bit more about his son and a little bit more about how he created. But the truth of the matter is, notice this, end of verse 2, God appointed his son the heir of all things, and by him also he, God, made the world. God made the world. Well, I don't think so. I think, you think what? Now let me share something. I'm not trying to be ugly to anybody. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm just trying to help you think through a little bit. You have a choice. Either there is an intelligent supreme being who did make all things, or you and I and everything we've ever known, everything that's ever happened in history, everything in the entire universe is one gigantic accident. Because either it had creator, designer, or it just happened for no purpose or intent. There's got to be one or the other. Well, no, you don't understand, preacher. Well, there's a lot of things I don't understand. But I think I've got a little bit of a handle on this. It doesn't take a, a PhD in astrophysics to figure this out. Folks, let me let me help you with this. There's, the other theory is that there was gas. And gas formed and circulated and compacted and exploded. And out of that becomes everything. Including living organisms. And wait a minute. Wait a minute. Out of that, everything that came out works in perfect order and has for as far back as anything we can discover. It's all worked in perfect order. By accident? Folks, I'm sorry. That makes no sense at all. None whatsoever. And the only people who believe that, and again, I'm not trying to be ugly to anybody, the only people who believe that are people who just in their own heart and mind just do not want to acknowledge the Creator. And the reason they don't want to acknowledge the Creator is they realize if they acknowledge a the Creator, they're going to have to be responsible to the Creator, and they don't want to be. They want to be me, myself, and I, and nobody, not even anybody, not including God, is going to tell me what I can and can't do. Problem with that. People tell you what you can and can't do all the time. You don't think so? Go out here and just disregard all the laws and see what happens to you. Break any law you want to and see what happens. People are going to tell you what you can and can't do. I, I got another one for you. How about this? You get a letter in the mail that says Internal Revenue Service. And it says you owe X number of dollars. And you write them back and say, I ain't paying it and you can't make it. And see how that turns out. It's not going to turn out well for you, I guarantee you. You do things that you don't want to do all the time. People tell you what you can and can't do all the time. All the time. You go to the doctor, and the doctor tells you, you're going to have to quit eating this. But I like that. Well, how long do you want it? <laughs> they tell you what you can and can't do all the time. But we don't like it. Why? Because we're rebellious by nature, that's the truth of the matter, and we want to be independent. But either we've got to acknowledge that everything, everything in this great universe is an accident, it came about for no logical or explainable reason, or there's a creator who intelligently designed, and not only designed it, but keeps it all going. Let's take a look at that. Read verse 2 again. We're going to go to verse 3 and learn more about this sun. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go back to verse 1. It'll, again, help the flow of thought. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by his prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Now here's more about it. Who, the Son of God, who being the brightness of his, God's glory, he is the brightness of God's glory. We read about Moses, who went up and met with God in the mountain. And when he came down, his face was glowing because he'd been in the presence of God. We read of other people, angels who have been in the presence of God, and the Bible talks about their appearance as being glowing, sometimes even hard to look upon, because they've been in the presence of God. And there's a glory 
to God himself. You read about it in Ezekiel, you read about it in the Revelation. There's a glory to God himself. And those in his presence pick up some of that glory. But this says that the Son of God is the brightness of his glory. Do you know in the Revelation it tells us that in the new heaven and new earth, they, they don't need the sun? They don't need the S-U-N, why not? Because the S-O-N is the light there. He is the brightness of the glory of God. And not only that, this next phrase really needs to get your attention. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. What does that mean, the express image of his person? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means exactly what John was writing about in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 and 14, where he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Catch that. All things were made by him. By who? The Word. And without him was not anything made that was made. So what didn't he make? There's nothing that he didn't make. We skip down to 14 verse. And the word was made flesh. The word that was in the beginning with God. The word that was God. The word that made all things. And without him was not anything made that was made. Became flesh. Put on a human body. And walked around here on the earth. The word became, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. What's that? The Son of God. Full of grace and truth. Now, the writer of Hebrews here, when he says that the Son of God is the express image of God's person, he's saying the same thing John was saying. He's saying the same thing Paul was saying in 1 Timothy 3.16, when he said, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What is the mystery of godliness? Here it is. God was manifest. The word manifest means made visible. God was made visible in the flesh. God was here in the flesh, visible. God was made visible in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then received up in the glory. There's only one person that describes Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus the Christ. No question about who he's talking about. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. I want you to hold Hebrews 1 here and back up just a little bit with me to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Not too far back there. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and when you get there, look at verse 15. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. This is talking about Jesus. Now, remember, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, God of Jesus, the Son of God, is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. It also says he upholds all things by the word of his power. Now look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, talking about Jesus Christ. It says, who, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. Remember in John 14, when Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And he said, Whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Philip spoke up. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. It suffices us. You know what Philip said? Can you show us God? I want to see God. What did Jesus say to Philip? Check it out, John 14. He said, Have I been so long time with you? Hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Why did he mean? What did he mean when he said he has seen me and seen the Father? Because the Son is the express image of his person. 
And here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now watch verse 16, Colossians 1, 16. For by him, by who? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were made that were created by him and for him. Clearly, the Son of God is the Creator. But watch something else here. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. And He is before all things. That means He existed before everything else existed. He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. I heard something yesterday I thought was in there. Some people will ask the question, and understand that somebody would ask this. That, okay, if He is the Origin of all things. Where'd God come from? Okay. Uh, we could spend some time talking about that. Let me give you a short answer to that. The long answer. The short answer is you and I live in the realm of time. In the realm of time, everything has a beginning, everything has an ending. God does not live in the realm of time. God lives in the realm of eternity, where things do not have to have a beginning and an ending. They just continually exist. Now that's the short answer. There's a long answer to that. But here's what I heard yesterday. I thought it was interesting. Person said that one man said another man says. So if God's the origin of all things, where did God come from? The other man said, Well, I'll answer that if you tell me that in your theory, where did all that gas come from? And he couldn't. He couldn't answer that. You see, Sometimes Christians think that we have to give all the answers, and we should give answers. Don't misunderstand me. We should give answers. The Bible says, let you always be ready to give an answer concerning the faith that is in you. But sometimes we think that people who don't believe in God, they don't have to answer the same questions, but they do. If there is no God, if there is no creator, if there's no designer, then where did all this stuff come from? Well, they used to say that matter always existed. Matter could neither be created nor destroyed. Matter has always existed. Wait a minute, that sounds a lot like eternity to me. What do you think? It does, doesn't it? So, I can believe that matter has always existed, can't be created or destroyed, but I can't believe that about God. You see, one answer, it does not negate the other, does it? If there's always been matter, why is it so hard to say that it's always been God? But now they don't say that so much anymore. Scientists don't. They, some of them still say that. A lot of them don't say matter has always existed. A lot of them say, guess what? Everything had a beginning. Time itself had a beginning, and everything in the universe had a beginning. They call it the Big Bang. Okay? If everything had a beginning, why cannot you say in the beginning God? God created. I'll tell you why. Because you don't want to acknowledge God. And you don't want God to have authority in God. It's that simple, folks. It's really no more intricate or complicated than that. Plus, is 117. He is before all things. He existed. I'm sorry. He existed before all things. And by him, all things consist. Another important statement. Not only does it say that he created all things, it says by him all things consist. So not only did he create everything, he's the one that keeps it all going. He's the reason everything stays in order. He's the reason the moon doesn't fly off into space. No, that's gravity. Where did gravity come from? And by the way, what is gravity? Well, it's the pull of the earth. Well, that's good. Can you, pun intended, can you go any more in depth on that? Uh, well, no, we don't really have a definition for gravity. No, we don't, do we? But we know it exists. No question about it. But what about the Earth continuing orbiting around the sun? What about all the rest of the universe operating in order? And by the way, the universe itself is expanding. That's pretty much acknowledged across the board. The universe is expanding. Why is it expanding? Because it had a starting point and went out. Oh, there's your big bang. Or you could say that. Or why can't you say there was creation? Why do you have a problem with that? 
because it requires you to acknowledge God. That's why you have a problem. Well, science has proved science hasn't proven anything about the origin. You know why? No scientist was there to see it. No scientist was there to say, I saw it, this is what happened in right now. Everything they present is a theory. Now, theories are based on evidence. It's not just a shot in the dark guess, there, there's evidence. But I'm telling you, the evidence doesn't point back to nothing. The evidence points back to something, and not just something, but someone, and that someone is called Jesus Christ. That's what I'm telling you. So, going back to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, who, Jesus Christ, being the express, brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. Again, not only did he create everything, he is what keeps it all up. What does it say? How does he, how does it, by him all things consist? He upholds all things by the word of his power. Go back to the creation story in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And if you go through the whole story, over and over it says, and God said, and it was so. And God said, and it was so. So by the word of God were the heavens formed. We're told that in Psalm 30. By the word of the Lord were the heavens formed. But not only were they created by the word of the Lord, it is by the word of his power that everything continues. What are we talking about? We're talking about the creator and king of the universe. Now, not only that, but look at this. Verse 2, no, I'm sorry, verse 3 again. Who being the brightness of God's glory, his glory, God's glory, the express image of his, God's person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, God himself, purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. What exactly does that mean? Well, again, hold your place in Hebrews 1 and turn over to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I'll show you precisely what that means. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 25. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25. Well, let's go to verse 24. Again, I think it'll help with flow of thought. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ has not entered into holy places made with hands, which are the figures or pictures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Who's us? That's you and me. Verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What does it say? God came in the flesh, was here on earth, offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. He appeared, he was here, he was visible, people saw him, they heard him, they touched him, they walked with him, they talked with him, they ate with him, they saw him, he was here. He appeared, and why did he appear? To put away sin. Whose sin? Mine and yours. How? By the sacrifice of himself. 27, and as it is appointed unto men once wants to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Not only did he appear and sacrifice for our sins, but he's coming again. Now look at the next chapter, chapter 10, and look at verse 11. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Why did he do that? Because in biblical times, and apparently the tradition came from God himself, the highest place in, of honor in any kingdom is to sit at the king's right hand. 
And for a priest to sit down in the Old Testament temple and tabernacle, there were no chairs, there were no seats. Because to sit down means your work is finished. The old priest never sat down. Why? Their work was never finished. Go back to chapter 1. Verse 3 again. Who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He sat down. Johannes Kepler, best known for his studies on the laws of planetary motion, Johannes Kepler said this, Science is the process of taking God's thoughts after you. I'm going to run that by you again. The man who discovered the laws of planetary motion said, Science is the process of thinking God's laws after you. I want to share with you something else, and it won't keep you much longer. We're just about finished here. Your brain is made up of primarily neurons. And neurons look kind of like little octopuses. And they are charged with electric, electricity. I, I'm not making this up. Your body operates primarily off of electricity. Now it's very low voltage electricity, so you can't go stick your fingers in the wall socket and get recharged. Okay? Well, if, if our body works on electricity, how can electricity harm us? Because you get too much of it. If you get too much of anything, it's, it's not good for you. you got to have water to live. Does that make sense? If you get too much water, what happens? You drown. You've got to be real about it. you got to have air to live. But if a hurricane comes, it'll blow you away. All right? You get too much of things. So you, your body works on low voltage electricity, and your brain, these neurons in your brain, do things, fire off synapses, and they send messages along your nervous system to your muscles, and that's how you work. For example, all the time, you don't have to stop things out, all the time, your brain is sending electrical impulse down your heart, saying beep, 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 beep. You don't have to say, oh, oh I forgot to tell my heart. You don't have to do that. It happens. And if you want to do this, raise your hand. The brain just tells, sends a signal along your nervous system, tell your hand to raise. Well, close your fist. Brain tells you to close your fist. And everything in your body works that way. Your breathing, everything happens that way. All your organs work because your brain tells them what to do how along this system of your, your nervous system. The impulse is sent along that. Send messages to you. Let's go deeper than that. That is, by itself, evidence of fantastic design. That is evidence of an intelligence created. But let's go deeper. Francis Collins grew up as an atheist. His parents were atheists. Francis Collins was an atheist. He grew up an atheist. He was an atheist into adulthood. Francis Collins was one of two men assigned to decode the human genome. That means they went into the DNA molecule and figured out what causes humans to be different from others that are similar in DNA. By the way, sometimes uh, somebody's going to run this by you. know, there are very similar, very much similarity, just a small percentage of difference between the DNA of a chimpanzee and a human being. Therefore, that's proof that <coughs> human beings came from chimpanzees. All right, before you buy that argument, let me tell you this. You know, there's very little difference in the DNA of human beings and a banana. So do human beings come from bananas? Yeah, probably not. Huh? You think? Probably not. Okay. It's that small percentage of difference that makes all the difference. Does that make sense to you? And by the way, if the DNA of different things, human beings, chimpanzees, bananas, are have similarities, doesn't that speak to you? of a common designer? Would that make sense? Let me, let me give you a, a commonplace advertise, uh, illustration. Not advertise, maybe an advertisement, I don't think about it. Long story short, years ago, I had a Chevrolet, and I still have a Chevrolet, not the same one, and a guy got in my Chevrolet, and he cranked the window, 
just telling you how long ago it was, cracked the window and broke the handle off. Now, I was a busy man then, and I was doing a lot of things. I was teaching school, I was working at church, and doing a lot of things. Didn't have a lot of time to work on that. But right down the street from the school that I taught in was a Pontiac dealer. And I went in there, and I walked up to the, I had a Chevrolet Camaro, I walked up to the parts desk in the Pontiac dealer, and I said, I need a window crank handle for a firebird, Pontiac firebird. Guy hands it to me, I grab it, put it in. Now how come I could put the window crank handle from Pontiac firebird on my Chevrolet Camaro? Because they had the same designer. Does that make sense to you? Okay, they were designed by the same people. It was no problem, and it worked. Okay, so if there's similarity to the DNA of a chimpanzee, a banana, and a human, could it be they had the same designer? You think? See, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Francis Collins, former director of the Human Genome Project, said this. These things, studying the human genome and the DNA molecule in the human genome, these things have led me from being an atheist to becoming a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. What led him to that? Studying the complexity of our origin. He didn't look at that and say, there can't be a God. He looked at it and said, there has to be a God. And he sought to find it, and he did. If Jesus Christ is the originator and the creator of all things, and if Jesus Christ keeps all things going, and if Jesus Christ gave himself and sacrificed for our sins, isn't Jesus Christ worthy of your trust, your faith, and following him? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we've had this time together. And Lord, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, it's my prayer that our hearts would be open. <clears throat> Lord, acknowledge you, not only as our great creator, but as our savior who loved us and gave himself a sacrifice for our sins. Lord, it may be that everybody in this room has already trusted you as their Savior. I look on the outward appearance, you look on the heart. But Lord, if there's even one person here who has not already received you by faith, called on you and asked you to save you, my prayer that right now, right where they sit, that person would open their heart and call on you and say, Lord Jesus, I do believe. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you love me. I believe that you paid for my sins on the cross. I believe that you're alive today. And right here, right now, I'm trusting you to forgive my sins, to save me, and give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And maybe you prayed that prayer, maybe you didn't. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation here in just a second. The hymn of invitation is just that. It's an invitation. I'm inviting you to come forward. I'm inviting you to meet me down front. If you're not 100% certain that when you close your eyes the last time, when you breathe your last breath, that you're going to step into the presence of the Savior forever, you come and we'll help you. We'll not keep you long. We'll not keep you from doing anything you need to do or anywhere you need to go. We'll just take a few moments, take the Bible, God's Word, and show you how you can know for sure that your sins are forgiven, your soul is saved, and heaven is your home. You come. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I, I'm not there. I've been saved. Well, thank God for you. But God's been speaking to you about something else. Maybe nothing I've touched on this morning, but God's been dealing with you, and you know it. And this is your time, your opportunity to respond and say, Lord, have your own way in my life. If that's you, when we sing this in, don't wait. Slip out in place. Come meet us down front. God's spoken to you. You come on. You need to know that you're saved. You come on.
There's a spiritual need in your life. You need prayer. You come. Father, bless me in this time we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're singing this morning hymn number 388. 388.